All right, welcome back, family. Happy Monday to you. Happy Monday to you. Thank you for joining us once again on the Parent Power Hour. We are joined, as always, we are always blessed to have such esteemed guests and first responders, if you will, to the educational crisis that's going on. Uh, we have with us today Ms. Caprina Coleman, who is a counselor from the mighty Fort Worthington, colleague of mine, and Mr. Ryan Kaiser, who is a uh, teacher at Mount Washington. Welcome both of you. And as of always, of course, Tyrone Barnwell, the face of the franchise. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. And family, you would just have to ignore um, Rebecca's name and title there uh, in the tile she is producing for us today. So they, they can't um, even see it. What'd you say? They can't even see it. They can't even see it. So I just made a fool of myself, but that's fine. Because what do we say, Tyrone? <laughs> This is live television. Ryan, Caprina, this is what we say. Undoubtedly, we may have one or two, you know, flaws. And we just tell the, the, the folks at home, this is live TV. And they're always so good to us. Uh, also, we always get comments and questions from our audience. And Tyrone will be managing those. So you'll be fielding questions from them as well. But before we start, uh, our connection question family, please feel free to chime in um, by Facebook. Uh, the question will start with you, Caprina. Okay. What is one out of the house activity that you will do when you deem it's safe to do so? Well, I like to eat, so I want to go to some fine dining. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sit down right. with some friends and just enjoy a good meal. <laughs> okay. Right, right. Well, yeah. well, you know what's funny? What's funny, uh, Caprina, is people are already indulging in that. I've seen, I've seen some <laughs> folks doing that. Uh, Ryan, how about you? I'm not ready yet. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm at the. Uh, I have my children are at the age where they're all involved in some sort of sports. So, I just want to be able to go to one of their sport. I even go to a practice at this point, and. Yeah. Uh, enjoy being outdoors with them, watching them have fun with their friends. Uh, so, although eating sounds pretty good right now too. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Tyra? Yeah, I was thinking, I, um, I cook, so the food thing doesn't, you know, fascinate me too much. I can <laughs> do all that at home. We've been eating pretty good at home. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I don't know y'all, like I'm, I'm scared to go out. I, <laughs> so I really don't know. And being around a group of people makes me nerd, you know, like a large, like it just makes me nervous. So I, I, I really can't say it. I mean, it's a part of me. Like I, I kind of, I, I do want to know, I, I know. I, I do want to do something where my kids would enjoy because, you know, I feel like for them, they have really been like, you know, just in the house. Um, <clears throat> like that so I don't know maybe like um maybe six flags or you know something like that to mm -hmm. be able to get nice. them and, and for them to be able to enjoy themselves and stuff and you know I'll be able to just sit in the shade and not really engage with people <laughs> 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 be everything yeah so so I think six flags would probably be nice. um, my choice yeah. all right uh similar for me it would be the beach taking the family to the beach and just being out there relaxing enjoying the water and the sun. So um, thank you all very much. Uh, family, today's title is uh, MSDE, Maryland School Department of Education Recommendations and where schools should go from here. Of course, the last five, six shows that we've had, of course, have been um, all the discussions that are prevalent right now with the COVID-19 uh, crisis epidemic. Um, and so that is where we find ourselves continually. Uh, about two weeks ago, um, the governor and state superintendent, Karen Salmon, announced some recommendations for schools uh, moving forward. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today to uh, two experts, one in the classroom and one in and out and around the classroom. Um, but let's start, uh, Ryan, with you, distance learning, something that's new to most of us here in the district. Uh, what are your takeaways? Uh, how do you think it's going for, for you and your, your scholars? Um, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, about, 
for me, about three years ago, I, I started putting most of my um, documents that we work on in a classroom, anything paper, moving it to also on Google Docs. I was thinking there'd be a, a blizzard at some point or something crazy, definitely not this, um, where students might need to be home for a month even. So I started mm -hmm. um, putting everything on there. So for them transitioning into just working on that at home really was that was not a huge transition there was a there's a few bumps in the road but it wasn't a huge transition transition for them mm -hmm. for me the hardest part has actually been like having a, a live stream with them because i have four kids of my own from kindergarten to high school and mm -hmm. uh, my wife teaches at a university too so you know we're one of those families that bought a small house so we could have experiences with our kids and mm -hmm. so no, that's uh <laughs> It's really not working to our advantage right now. So I actually have the office for the first time since mid-March. Uh, my wife's been down here like day and night uh, with her university. And so I've been like teaching my kids at the same time as trying to work with my own students. So a lot of it's just been interacting with them in, in their documents. And it's something they've been used to because um, we've been doing it, doing it also in the classroom um, for the most part of the last three years. Um, uh, had the ability to do that. So um you know, some of the basics are, are going right, but like the connection, you know, just being with the kids and I know we can't be in person, but seeing them as much as I would like, it's not there. And I'm, uh, that's the part I really don't like. And everyone's going through the same thing too. So. Sure. And Marcus, just follow up, Ryan, how, how are your students? Um, what are their feelings when, you know, when there's Mr. Kaiser, you know, what, what kind of things are, are they communicating to you about the fact that they aren't, you know, in a physical space with you? Um, I think everyone's kind of resigned to the fact that they, this is going to be a long haul. And so there hasn't been, Hey, I can't, at the beginning there was, Hey, can't wait to see you in a few weeks. Or I was like, I don't know about all that. Um, so I, I think everyone's just been kind of like realizing this is, this could be a while. So I haven't got a lot of that lately. Um, but early on there was, you know, some, they were hoping we could get back at some point but right now i don't hear a lot of that right now um but they just they understand the situation right thank you uh miss caprina coleman uh you do such marvelous work uh in the brick and mortar at the fort and as as your colleague i know that you're doing wonderful things keeping in touch with these students and their families at least attempting very hard to do so What's your experience with distance learning? If you could talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, I've actually been able to check in with some students. For some families, it seemed to be going better than it was when they were actually in the school buildings. And then for some, I feel like they're just disconnected. Um, overall, the students that are usually disconnected continue to stay disconnected. Um, you know, when you had problems trying to get them to come up for just daily routine check-ins at schools, you know, um, when they weren't there, they aren't there now. And so it's a disconnect. And so you do try to check in as often as you can and leave messages, letting them know that, you know, you're here to support them if they, you know, choose to reach out. And so um, it's a lot, you know, some students are and some are not. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, Ryan, I'd like to ask you about the Maryland Together MSDE recommendations. Um, what it, what's your take? I, I don't know how, if you've had a chance to read all of them, There's quite, quite a few there. Uh, what are your thoughts so far? Yeah, so we had a look at it um, about a week before the um, press conference with uh, Governor Hogan. And I've tried, <laughs> I've tried to do a deep dive in it several times now. I've got pages of notes here, but it's like, it's hard to do a deep dive on something that's not very specific. Mm -hmm. A lot of vague, um, kind of like, uh, go ahead and have at it within your own district, which creates, a, you know, I know a lot of teachers, the anxiety of why would we start creating something that only to have it turn around and have, have you just, the, the state to say, no, this is not gonna work. Um, and the state doesn't really know, have a lot of ideas either. So I think it should be more phrased like, here's a, um, um, some 
the Maryland uh, initial guidance just to get people started instead of this is the reopening plan because it's, it's two different things. And I, I've looked at as many different um, state plans over the last few days and they're all just as vague as ours um, with the exception of probably New York. And it doesn't even really say this is for schools too, but they have, New York's been really good about specific metrics and things they're looking at before they do phase one, two, and three. Um, but even if I have some notes here, like ours even says, assist in the art articulation of a vision that can be easily communicated to members of the school community. Um, it's a point of reference. You know, that's all in the first few pages there. So, I mean, it starts out saying it's vague and um, I didn't even see this till today down, like the last thing they says, this is says they will continuously update the recovery plan. So that, um, that's pretty good news. And I know we do have another meeting on June 1st to um, kind of talk about next steps because, you know, not only do we need to figure out what we're doing as a district, but we got to connect with all the different districts around us um, in some form or fashion and come up with some, uh, some plans because we're all going to have to interact one way or the other. Um, you know, you also have teachers who these students go to their own children go to school in a different district. And so when you start looking at different schedules, it can get really tricky real quick. Very true. Thank you for your insights. Uh, Caprina, now we think about reopening, we think about the recommendations, and we're really happy that you're on because some things, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that these kind of things have social and emotional impact on children. So from what you've gleaned from the plan so far, the recommendations anyway, so far, what are your takeaways and, and how are you thinking about moving with the Fort Worthington team uh, going forward? Yeah, so definitely there's going to have to be a lot to take into consideration um, around trauma and how it impacts us directly and indirectly. Um, I do think that we're going to have to phase a plan that not only deals with social emotional learning, but also professional development, you know, that stems around what does trauma look like for teachers, what does trauma look like for staff, as well as students. And um, I think that the district is starting to take that stuff into consideration when we look at. Um, them rolling out the social emotional learning competencies where we're talking about you know the self-awareness the self-management so they're starting to look at it as you know we have to look at everyone and make sure that they are whole because it's going to be a process it's going to be a process and i don't think that we'll truly know the impact until we're actually ready to roll you know into having students come back into the building it's going to have to be step by step. Um, I think that the, the district is also doing a really good job of doing those mindful moments where um, actually I saw an email today um, where they're doing mindful moments for you to be able to connect with the district to learn how to work on yourself um, through meditation, deep breathing, relaxation. And so I'm glad to see that. I think that they're going to have to do more as we continue to get closer to that date of actually reintegrating into a school building. Um, but I think that we're trying and I think that they are understanding that there are layers that we're going to really have to be able to peel. And it's gonna be step by step, it's gonna have to be. And All you right. won't know the impact until you're actually in it. That's very true. Um, I'm going to follow up with you in a moment before we go back to Ryan, but let's jump over to the hotline. Tyrone, do we have any questions or comments or shout outs for the family? So just shout out those who are on. We don't have any questions yet. Of course, and once we dig into, you know, conversation more, we will get, uh, but Sharonda, uh, G, Kiana, Hannah, Chastity, Octavia, Jaquetta, Joanne, um, Dozier, uh, we got Tay, Greg, Linda, Patricia, uh, another William, that's not you. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, Joan, those are some folks who are on there, like it's going as they're going and coming in. So we definitely had people like tuning in and uh, watching us, like, you know, as we dig in more, um, as you guys share more into the conversation, I'm sure we'll start to get questions and stuff. But right now, just shout outs to everyone who's um, joined us um, via Facebook and stuff or via watch party uh, with us and do always submit your questions uh, for our guests or any comments that you would like um, to, to, to share with us. All right, family, thank you all so much for joining us. You make the show what it is. The show is yours. The show is for you to empower you and our students out there. Um, you know, you, you, you talked about layers. Um, I feel funny calling you Caprina, but I'm gonna keep saying Caprina, not Miss Coleman, because we're not at school. Um, Caprina, you talked about the different layers, um, which are very important. This is not a simple one-dimensional solution. We're back, we're gonna social, social distance, we're gonna wear masks and that's all and that's it. You know, that's not, it's not that simple at all. Um, can you speak to any safety precautions that you might want to see um, when we return to the fort or when we return throughout the district to brick and mortar as, as we're calling it now? We used to call it just schools, now we're saying brick and mortar. Like it's not, it's, you know, this, this thing has really um, changed our mindset. So thinking of safety, what would you say to that? Yeah. And so um, definitely, we're definitely gonna to have to step up our health and hygiene measures. Um, I don't know how that's gonna look, but we definitely gonna to have to be creative and we're gonna to have to figure out what that looks like. Um, smaller classroom sizes, I know <laughs> that um, I think that that needs to be taken heavily into consideration as we figure out what that's gonna look like, if that's gonna be A day, B day, or, you know, what are the different scenarios that they're going to use? Um, again, those staggered schedules possibly. Mm -hmm. And I think that we definitely need to continue with the remote, remote learning. Mm. I think that needs to be done indefinitely all year because we don't know what's going to happen once we get back. And then you keep hearing about them saying that there may be a second version of this right. when it gets cold again. And so I think that if we get them in the mindset of being on there regularly, if we ever have to shut down again, it will be considered the new norm. And they'll be able to be more flexible as students and staff and parents. And so, um, yeah, I just think that we definitely really just need to sit together and you know, look through our creative lens and determine what works best for each school. And Ryan, each school. before I go to you, I I'm sorry to cut you off, but before I go to you, Ryan, um, Caprina, I'm just gonna push a little bit because I've seen you in action yes. when a student is triggered and they're having an emotional difficulty in the moment. I've seen you and how calmly you're able to deescalate the students. Um, and it's mm -hmm. a credit to what you do and, and we're blessed at the fort to have you. Thinking about some of those students that may be easily triggered Right. Or, or some of these things that are kind of compounding on their lives. So, that you know, you know, as maybe one thing wasn't as big a trigger. Now it might be because of the situation. I mean, how do we, you know, as a counselor, how do we kind of mitigate if that's possible, those kind of things with kids coming in? Absolutely. So um, definitely reaching out to those students that we already know, you know, are going to be impacted through trauma. Um, definitely establishing some needs assessments where we are pretty much asking staff members, teachers, you know, administration to share with us some of the concerns that they're seeing mm. so that we can start looking at it differently from their lens mm. to determine an action plan. Because, yeah, we're going to definitely have to reach out to those that we already know as students that have problems with trauma and setting up those individual um, sessions, possibly group sessions, depending on the need and the students. Yeah, we just gonna have to be creative. There's no, there's no one you know, easy way to say that it's gonna have to be. It's gonna be like puzzle pieces, trial and error, seeing if this works, if it didn't, okay, then how can we um, change this? How can we be more creative? 
So it's, yeah. But we definitely need to start with those needs assessments, determining what are the needs of the students and how can we address them? Thank you. Orion, what about you? Uh, safety concerns, or I should say precautions that would allow you to feel comfortable uh, in, in this new era of, um, of learning? Yeah, well, I think uh, we can learn a lot watching what Europe is doing, Asia, when they're coming back to schools. And I know I just saw a brief um, update that France already has to shut down some of their schools they started um, and there was an outbreak. Um, but like also with this, the restaurants and um, what some of these sports teams are doing right now and how they're spacing out, obviously being in a stadium is much different than um, being in, in a school. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised like we see restaurants this summer start putting up big tents out in the parking lots across streets in New York. Uh, they're already kind of looking at doing that. And I, I don't know. Uh, and this, again, this all comes back to money too, which is going to be a whole separate conversation, but like having, um, I'm thinking like some of the black tops, I, I would much prefer to teach outside as long as possible in the fall. Um, mm -hmm. it doesn't spread as quickly. Uh, there's a whole bunch of there's research still going in it, but yeah. outdoors is about as safe as you can get. And, um, I would like to see that as a possibility. Um, soap, I mean, a lot of our schools, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, broken soap dispensers. They don't, they're not refilled. Um, mm -hmm. Clear hallway patterns where kids can walk. It sounds, you know, very elementary, but, you know, I think, um, or, or is it the teachers that need to, you know, for me to teach in middle school, is it, is it the teachers that need to transfer, mm -hmm. go to the different classrooms and the kids stay put um, as much as possible? Um, a lot of our schools, the windows don't open or, you know, they were built at a time where they couldn't, they weren't even meant to be open or some have been uh, screwed shut over the years. There needs to be a lot of ventilation and that needs to be figured out um, if we're going to be, if we're going to be in close uh, quarters together. And um, it probably really needs to be um, policies and the discussion around, you know, sixth, seventh grade boys, a lot of them like the horseplay. I got a sixth grader upstairs and that's pretty much the only thing he likes doing. Yeah. Now we have that on top of that, that could change a teacher's life, especially, you know, some of our teachers that could be very susceptible to this disease. Mm. You do about that. That, that, that part really concerns me, not only as a safety caution, but like also what do we do and not, I mean, I just, I honestly don't have the answers for it, but there needs to be a discussion around it. And I need to have it with my sixth and fourth grade son upstairs, both of them. Um, because it's, it's a different time and place right now until there's a vaccine figured out or better treatments. Um, from the state and city level, there needs to be, and I'm, I'm glad um, both Baltimore County and city and some uh, other surrounding areas have said, well, we're still waiting to have enough testing uh, and the contact tracing so we can figure out who they've come in contact with. And I know Hogan just announced today that have hired another thousand people to do that. So that's that's good, you know, and we're still in May. We're talking about coming back in September. So, you know, I see small, small increases of how the, this could be better. And then what do we do about masks, PPE? Are we frontline workers? Like uh, a lot of, like, I, I would argue that we're more of a frontline worker than sure. most people out there. We're gonna come in the most close contact sure. with other people, adults, kids, it doesn't matter. And what does that look like? What is required? What are we requiring people? And can you require people to wear uh, face masks? Um, and it's really hard to talk. I mean, I've gone shopping a couple times here. I've, I've started to venture out of the last couple of weeks and do a couple of things. And just talking to a, a, a cashier register with both of our masks on, you can't, we can't, we're like, what? And then when we have, end up doing this thing, like, what? Start talking to each other, you know, <laughs> it's like, like kind of defeats the whole purpose. So, um, and then I, I think I saw like Denmark, there's a, a clear line between where the kids can be in the classroom and the teacher. So the kids weren't supposed to come across a certain area. And that's gotta be damaging too. And you, know, you talk about the emotional aspects of this. Once we're actually back together in the fall, I think it could be, you know, I don't know there's a lot that we're gonna have to think about and work through that we haven't even really thought about yet. And um, especially for little guys, you know, my kindergartner upstairs, when he sees his teachers again, 
Well, you know, he can't just run up and give him a hug. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's going to be tough for him. And I've seen him um, kind of slowly, the, the youngest ones especially, slowly kind of um, gravitate inwards a little bit. They're not sure what's going on and how to react. He's not really scared of anything, but he doesn't know how to, he, he doesn't, I know for him, he probably doesn't want to potentially cause harm to somebody else. He knows that enough about that, that. Um, even when like we've gone on walks and we've seen a friend from his kindergarten class and they kind of just do this a quick wave instead of, you know, stopping and talking because they're so nervous about causing harm to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, but then like, yeah, then my older boys, they could care less. I mean, they're ready to wrestle the next friend they see. <laughs> I don't feel like that's not going to work either. Um, there probably needs to be some sort of re-entry discussion with students um, virtually um before we step back in the classroom um it's just a lot a lot to think on and at the same time a lot can happen between now and september um so i don't know there's and i know people think about this everywhere and no one's really come up with a great plan yet i think people i think we have the luxury of seeing what's going on in europe and asia and see what they did right and wrong re-entering into the classrooms and you kind of go from there Tyrone, hotline. Yeah, so um, um, as you said, right, we had a parent that said they think it'll be difficult for pre-K and kindergarten kids to not be able to run up to their teachers. They're, you know, so used to hugging their teachers and running up to them. And I would like, I would also say, I, you know, I think it, even for some you know, a little up from there. Um, you know, when teachers and kids have those kind of relationships, you know, you see those students and those teachers kind of embrace each other like that. Like one, one of my daughters teaches, my daughter's in the eighth grade going to high school. And I mean, this school year, like her and Ms. Murchison, uh, you know, they embraced each other every, you know, every chance they got. Um, so that would be, you know, I know that would be difficult. Then we had a parent ask, um, how do you teach effectively with the mask on? You know, if that is going to be, how do you do that? Um, someone also asked, um, um, is there anything that is good about distant, distance learning that you would keep long term? So y'all hold those two quite y'all y'all keep those two. Am I gonna answer that? And then um, the other question, and then the other question also um, is, what role would support staff and admins play? Um, you know, if you know, once we return back to school. Let's start with Caprina. You you mentioned. Uh, the continuation of distance learning in some form. What what are your thoughts on that? So, you know, definitely. You know, I, I thought about that, and I'm looking at it from a counselor perspective, and not necessarily from a teacher's perspective. Sure. And so, you know, I just feel like having that platform will give them you know, a routine structure to adapt. You know, a lot of times when I talk to students, especially when they are now in the virtual world, sometimes they feel like they are overwhelmed and they're frustrated. And it's because they're not used to developing a schedule. And so we can use this platform to say to them, okay, now that you're dealing with this, you can start developing a schedule for you to be able to excel and then looking at students that want to go to college, you know, and, and, and saying that this can look a lot like it would look if you were dealing with professors yes. and how yeah. you would have to be responsible for, you know, your learning process. And so just having those kind of conversations with them, I think is important. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, what do you think um, should some semblance of this is learning continue. What's good about it in your eyes? Yeah, I, I think a couple of things. I really like that responsibility piece. Um, I think mm -hmm. students, uh, if they haven't figured it out, they probably should pretty quick. You need to be responsible for your own work because we don't know in your own schedule. We don't know what the next what school is going to look like when we come back in the fall. 
I know for my own children, we um, develop, we print out schedules and we put them like in a little, right. and they, they go through the checklist each day. Now, sometimes they check things off without actually doing them, we found out, <laughs> um, but they know they should have done it. And they, 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 we get those emails from the teachers when their work isn't done. Um, <laughs> I know my kindergartner, I've gone from laughing at the thought that he's going to log himself into his work mm -hmm. and how that would even look to like, I'd looked over yesterday, he opened up the computer, sat down, found his Google class and all this and that all by himself. I'm like, okay, there's some long-term basic right. skills here that, you know, sometimes we're in a classroom, like, hurry up, just do this here. Here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. And you, you kind of, you tend to like do a lot of the things for them instead of really passing that baton right. off to them. Now it's really forced a lot of um, um, students to do that. And we need to do a better job of teaching that in the classroom once we come back. Yeah, we but I also yeah. like the, I don't like the distance learning, but um, I think it gives them more of an idea of what they can do at home and what they can mm -hmm. do at home. If this happens again, what we probably need to do is practice again once we get back into school. Like, all right, here's how you pull up your different uh, assignments. This is how you submit something. Um, if you're using a different laptop, um, here's how you access your, um, your school account, that type of thing. And, uh, I think when we get back, you know, not, there's a lot of things we're going to have to kind of just slowly practice that we notice didn't go as perfectly as we had wanted, but also kind of push back in the students a little bit like, Hey guys, this is a different day and age. We, in October, November, we could be out of school three weeks again. So mm -hmm. let's don't, let's. Let's make sure we know what to do if we are home to at least maintain some sort of semblance of school over those three weeks. Um, hopefully we get lucky and it doesn't come back uh, uh, as bad as it has. I don't think it will, but no. we could definitely be out for a period of time and we just have to be ready for it. But I think that's the first thing we kind of need to prepare our students to do um, once we get back. Can I add something else to that? So were you finished, Ryan? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I just also wanted to add the piece that, um, you know, the district is really talking about trying to get the kids to understand the social emotional learning piece. And so when you're distance learning, one of the components of SEL is self-management. Self-management meaning that you have to motivate yourself to get your work done. And so I think that that's another thing that's helping them you know, in that process. I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Caprina. Uh, Ryan, I was, you kind of alluded to it with your uh, mask down, mask up conversations at the grocery store. One of our parents asked, um, what would that look like being the, ma you know, teaching with the mask and having students have masks? <laughs> It'll look weird. It'll sound <laughs> like we're all going through the drive through at McDonald's. And um, I appreciate your candidacy. <laughs> you know i was at giant and finally i they put up those um the screen between yourself and um okay, sure. and giant. yeah and so like I, we, I, we both finally just stepped behind it and, and took our um mass off and started talking and so i wonder i mean this sounds so weird but like some sort of i don't know this sound, the more i talk about it out loud the more weird it sounds but like some sort of like plastic see-through barrier, just enough, like maybe right here that my, my voice and imitate, you know, it spreads a lot through talking. And yeah. so, you know, you're talking to students in a large classroom, you're really, the, the, the droplets really spread far and wide. Right. Um, and if you think about it, the thing that really scares me the most is music. And um, I don't know if you saw the study, but there was a, a, a choir practice mid early March in Seattle one person had it out of 60 some and they're in there belting out um tunes and um 42 people got it mm -hmm. and yeah. we died and um that really scares me and talking to a large class isn't much different than singing as far as yeah you really got to project your voice across a class sure. mm -hmm. um but i don't even with mask on that's going to be tricky so i this, again, the more I talk about it out loud, the more weird it sounds, but maybe it's the only thing to do until we have um, something in place, but, uh, a vaccine in place, but some sort of natural, mm -hmm. not natural barrier, that's not, uh, but like a, a plastic barrier where um, I can talk loud enough, but not have it be um, uh, 
any transmissions back and forth with the kids. And uh, another thing that they found too is it's getting in the, the eyes. Um, so <laughs> like there's so much to really think on. Um, that, and then it comes back again to the money. Yeah. You get money for this stuff. Uh, even even some basic masks, you know, those 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 aren't cheap. Um, and for the kids to have them, and are we requiring it? Um, I don't know. I mean, we, we'll figure it out on the fly if we have to. If everyone is required and everyone's wearing them, we're going to figure it out. We always do. Um, but it's going to look and sound pretty awkward at, at first. Mm -hmm. uh, Tyrone, did we answer yeah. all of those questions? I know we got two out of three. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, someone else asked what would admin, you know, number one was what would admin and supportive staff roles be in there? Um, I just think that that's something that, we, you know, once we get to, I don't know if teachers could, you know, answer that and or know that or know what that looked like. We can come back to that. But I would like to mention that, uh, well, thank you, Megan, Stacy. Uh, we had a few other people join us. Um, shout out to Kay, Graham, and Dee Dee. But um, Megan says that her five-year-old is very efficient in the Google Classroom. She was agreeing with Ryan. Um, they're saying that her school had engaged them in iPad use before this happened. Um, and then a couple of other things came up, a couple of good points. Um, one question is, um, are you teachers seeing kids that are just falling off? And how do you reach out and help to build that self-motivation? That's one. And then two is, even once a vex, even if a vaccine is found, what about those parents and people who do not believe in using vaccinations? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I know, right? And I and yeah. that's, I was like, with that one, I had a, I was in a humongous conversation about that earlier today. I mean, me and like we were talking about that for it was just like, and it's like wow, because we know there are so many you know, highs and lows, right, about vaccines and, and different medications. So, so it's like, what do you do um, in that case? So y'all keep that in mind. And then lastly, um, before we run out of time, also the conditions of our schools. I know Ryan mentioned something about the, the you know, soap dispensers and stuff being broke. And another parent just mentioned how they always saw that something else coming in, the admin question outlet. Yeah, 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 I know that. <laughs> um, sorry, got, got a couple of devices I'm working on over here, y'all. That's why I'm not right there. But anyway, uh, even with that, we know a lot of school buildings are messed up. So if classroom sizes are made smaller, which they need to be, right? How, how do you have 30, 40 kids in the classroom? One is where do you get the teachers from? to manage all of these other places and where will these students go? Because a lot of buildings are not, um, you know, up to par and have proper equipment and stuff. So breaking down classrooms would mean we need more classrooms and more teachers. So where would this come from? And all we ever hear is that money is an issue. I don't think they're gonna have smaller. I don't think they mean everyone goes to school and we have smaller yeah. classrooms. I think they, it means half the kids would go one day and half the yeah. half next, which does bring up actually one of my biggest concerns too is childcare for teachers. Mm -hmm. um, if my son is on a B day and he doesn't go to school, my youngest, I think my oldest, oldest ones will be fine. Um, then what do we do here? And I think there needs to be some sort of agreement between districts. I would personally, I would like it if teachers, kids, whatever school they go to, let's say, I don't know, fourth or third grade below, whatever the certain age cutoff, they, they stay at those schools. Because um, if you look at um, the document, it talks about make sure schools get child care, the before and after care up after, you know, up early so the staff can send their kids to child care, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to do in the first place. Now you're kids are intermingling with other large groups of kids and then bringing it back to their schools. And um, again, none of these solutions are gonna make everyone happy or even remotely happy. But the, the teacher child care, I, I would hate to see this collapse on itself if teachers have to keep calling out every other day. If they're, they're their kindergarten or first grade child is uh, at home and we just, that, yeah. that doesn't seem feasible. Uh, 
Tyrone, one of the other questions you had there? Um, was, oh, hold up, I'm sorry, let me go, <laughs> go back to it. Um, this one, is it the one about um, how, okay, yes, if you are seeing kids that are just falling off, um, how do you reach out and help to build that self-motivation? Uh, Caprina, self-motivation, and then we'll come back to Ryan on how you're reaching out to the families. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, definitely having those conversations with students about setting goals. You know, where, where do you see yourself after being out this year? You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then trying to bridge the gap between where they want to be as far as an adult to where they are now and how the things that you do now is going to connect with you being that productive person that you want to be. So just having motivational conversations, mm -hmm. motivational conversations with students about what are your expectations for yourself? And if they're going to be honest with you, you know, setting goals and helping them to develop those short-term goals and those long-term goals for success. Um, there's something, and I was reading something recently, like I want to say like last week or so, and they were talking about motivational interviews. Hmm. And so again, everybody's pretty much talking about getting them to reach their full potential within themselves and getting them to understand the importance of it. I think that's what we're going to be doing. Hmm. We're definitely going to be having a lot of conversations about, you know, where do you want to go in your life? and getting them to understand the steps to get there with those goals. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, are you finding any of your students uh, that you haven't been in contact with or just really having trouble with adjusting to the distance slash online learning? If so, what are you doing to reach out to the families or what's the solutions? Yeah, I mean, early on, um some students would ask if they had to do this or had to do that. And they do not have to do anything right now. It's a pass, it's an incomplete. Um, there's the motivation, especially for my seventh graders uh, for the extra 6% um, on their grade at the end of the quarter. Um, you know, I've talked with them too, but like, you know, it's not about whether you have to do something or not. It's about even just maintaining some sort of semblance of learning and organization in your life over this, you know, I think they were originally thinking it's going to be two weeks, four weeks, and then, then it became a two months. And, um, you know, it's funny because even one of my own kids had asked, um, you know, for spring break, can we um, can we just not do anything for spring break, like any work? I'm like, a break from what? You haven't been doing much in the first place. Like, it's like kind of like four or five total assignments for the week they had to turn in, especially early on. I'm like, so what do you want to break from? A break from a break? Okay, I mean, you can do that. Is that what, you know, you're motivated to, you know, to kind of halfway do this as we move forward here? Um, but I, I like what you're saying about the motivational interviews. My, my wife's a school psychologist and she's oh, yeah. really good at that. And I think there should be um, probably some more training on how to do that. It's about how you ask students questions so they come yeah. hopefully to the right answer that, we want them to get to um, instead of just kind of like my answer with my own kids, like a break from what? <laughs> you know, like it kind of a little more positive. Questions, Ryan, open ended questions. So you can't give me a yes or no answer. <laughs> right? Exactly. And uh, the answer it's needs deeper. to be a good one. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, but I have had a few students who, um, you know, some of the work, I would just call them over the phone and we would walk through it. Uh, what their answers were, what they were thinking on, because it's history. It's most, actually, we're doing pretty much all current events right now, too. And um, so there's there's only been a few that have completely tuned out. A couple of them have actually teachers of, of their own as parents, and they've kind of just been doing their own thing. Um, you know, and a couple it, we've really just struggled getting a hold of, um, even after they've come up and picked up their laptops and everything. So actually, I'm actually a little surprised how much the kids have been staying on top of their work. Um, I'm more impressed with my students than my own children, but that's a, again, um, a whole other uh, topic. A parent, I don't, so just to, in, you know, and jump in really quick with that. And, 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 and I hear like, we have parents on here who are agreeing, um, but then we had another parent 
that comes in that just another parent comes in and say, um, yes, the students, you don't know what else they're dealing with. Are they eating? Um, you know, because school fed them, do they have clean clothes? Because we were washing clothes for them at some schools. Um, yeah, that's that's you know, that's a comment that another parent, um, that a parent has made. Um, and just wanted to do that to see if y'all wanted to, you know, kind of add anything or respond to that. Um as well. Sabrina? Yeah. So definitely when we're checking in with parents. Um, did you say Ryan? No, Cabrina. Okay. Um, when we're checking in with parents and families, just seeing what wraparound services are needed for the families as a whole. You know, it's not just about your child passing. You know, what do you need in your household to sustain? Um, I've had, even though I'm not a social worker, sometimes I'm talking to parents specifically about my bg &E is getting ready to be turned off. What am I supposed to do? You know, or um, I need to find my social security card because I'm trying to apply for this benefit. What do I do? And so being able to support them in those services and finding those things and just being a listening ear, you know, for families. Sometimes just you don't have the answer, but just being there to support and listen is important. And so we're going to have to look at those wraparound services and how we can how we can fill all of the needs so that they don't think that we're just all about passing. It's deeper than that. Sure. Ryan, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I probably lost in this too is how many students have lost members of their own family um, yeah. to the disease. I know, like for me, we had uh, two aunts, one in New York City and another in uh, Napa. Uh, area in California, they both had it. They're both in their 70s, and we were worried sick. And I'm trying to teach at the same time. Now they both, they both came out fine. It was actually they um, it was very mild symptoms and everything. Um, but you know that that was on top of my mind. Now, now if you have someone that actually passed away in your family or got really sick, and they're probably you know they were on a ventilator for a couple months. I know we've had um, um, this is my own school. Some students have been going through that too. Um, that's something we're really going to have to process when we come back because I really don't know the extent of how much each student has gone yeah. through with this, um, you know. So there, there's just yeah. a, a lot to ponder. I, I was kind of thinking school would be a, a bit of, a, you know, on the online learning, a bit of a, a break from the reality. Um, it's easier said than done. I think I know for my, myself, I need to do a better job of how, how to make that a, a, a break from like some, some things that are going on around us, but also understanding what's going on around us too. Um, but it, I, I'm curious to really how much of our students, how much that they have personally gone through, what that looks like in the fall when they come back to school, if they've lost one or two or three people in their family, like just like that, just over the last couple of months, yeah. it's just hard for us to even really ponder right now. Mm -hmm. yep. And it actually segues uh, to my last question, which is about family engagement. Um, Caprina, I know there's some challenges currently, but speak to us just a, if you will, maybe 30 seconds about that. And Ryan, I'll come to you. 30 seconds about family engagement and then what you think it should look like going forward. Yeah. So, um, you know, family engagement is definitely needed. Again, um, I don't think we'll really know the impact until we're actually there and we're talking to students and they're telling us their narratives of what they've been dealing with. Um, and so just being able to be able to process that is gonna be important for us to know how to react. Yeah, we're gonna to have to do some, um, some you know, social emotional learning lessons in classrooms. We're gonna to have to do some um, professional development to prepare us for what we don't know to prepare for. Yeah. yeah. Again, I think that once we get into it and we, you know, get these surveys done and we get to start to hear what people are dealing with, that will help us to know what to do next. Because, you know, a lot of times dealing with, you, you know, these emotional issues, you really can't plan for it. You yeah. just got to be prepared mm -hmm. as a response. Crisis intervention. Yeah. 
Thank you. Ryan, real quick, um, any thoughts on grade recovery or acad really academic loss for our students who you know, may not have um, had the acumen to really excel uh, as an online learner um, and or some students that just weren't able to uh, tech maybe had an issue with receiving technology or weren't able to um, log in at all. What do you think about that for the fall? Yeah, I'm, I'm equally as curious about this too, because, you know, um, at first when I was thinking like, all right, how much time are we really losing? Just having, just being totally honest here. Like we had a spring break we were supposed to have. Um, there was an election day that was supposed to be in there, uh, Memorial Day, and there's June. Okay, let's put June out there. Um, so originally I was like, how much time are we really losing with students here? But then when you think about, okay, man, it's been two months yeah. and already, and then you got three months of summer on top of it. It's, you put those together and now I'm really worried. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to look. I don't know if we can help if things get um, better that we can do some sort of in-person um, work with our uh, students that really need help. You know, I don't know how we would even identify them, but before we even get back to school, maybe there's a couple of weeks there, we could do some tutoring. I don't know, like some more small group setting or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I just, don't, we just don't know the damage um, yet even for those that have access to the laptops and things like that. None of our lessons are as robust as we would like them to be and as much as um, we would want them to learn. So I, I, there's just so much we're gonna have to learn on the fly that we just don't know right now. Um, but my hope is that we can do something before school starts with especially many of our high risk students that have not had any access or really struggled getting access, even if they could access their laptop at home, it was uh, it just wasn't the right environment at the right time when the teacher was teaching that lesson that day. Um, so um, I don't have a lot of answers other than I'm really, <laughs> and I want things to work work as good as possible when we transition into the fall. Thank you, Tyrone. I did, yeah. <clears throat> a couple of things. Last thoughts I want to acknowledge. I'm Octavia. Um, who says online learning has been very difficult for one of my children with an IEP um, during this time. Um, and then Octavia and Megan, a couple of other parents who are on here and myself just wanna thank um, you two, what's this one? Okay, that one, I'm gonna wait. Um, thank you two, <laughs> I'm telling you, I wish I could, anyway, my madness over here with my three devices is just, but I'm learning. Anyway, yeah, that's right. uh, I'm learning three different devices. I'm, I'm, I'm getting this thing under control anyway. But no, seriously, as a parent, <clears throat> and, and then these parents, we, we, I feel like we're on, I know we're on the same page just from their comments and agreeing, and agreeing with the things that we're communicating here and that you all are saying is thank you all for, you know, going the extra mile because that's what it is to me. Like teachers, you know, Ryan, you said that you have kids at home also, right? But to just hear you talk about wanting to do something a couple of weeks before school start, I have personally encountered some teachers that's like, what about me? What am I going to do about my kid? And I'm not saying that that's not important, right? That's totally important. And I understand the need to take it on. However, as a parent, who've never taught, who, who have no understanding of that. All we know is that y'all are the professionals and we need your help, right? So like, we're not thinking about everything else outside of that because we're stuck where we are. So to actually hear teachers who are talking about what I feel like is going above and beyond, like I, hats off to you all. I, I, you have not gotten enough recognition throughout this time. We hear the governor and the, you know, in the, in the president, well, y'all president, that ain't my damn president. We hear them, <laughs> we hear them, <laughs> we hear them praising, you know, these healthcare workers and, you know, all these people, but it's like, mm -hmm. come on, like, you know what I mean? Like, look at what you all mm -hmm. do and are doing to, you know, keep this going. Right. So we, you know, we have to thank you all so much. Again, especially you all who are going above and beyond um, to help us out during this time um, because everyone's not, right? Like there are some teachers who are just like, 
I got to maintain for me and mine. I, I can't think about okay. nobody else. You know, you, you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. you know, calling parents and figuring out a wraparound services and everything else they need. Yeah. Parent teachers yeah. aren't doing that. I got two mm -hmm. kids. I have set and I watch. I have one teacher of my daughter's kids who's, you know, do, do a little extra. Everybody else is like, log in, do your stuff, check in. That's it. We've had no outside conversations outside of that at all. So, I mean, seriously, um, thank you all there. They are green. I don't know if y'all can see my little screen, but got the little <laughs> hand clap saying thank you at the bottom and everything from the other parents on this page. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you family so much for chiming in. Those are great questions for our experts today and, and very encouraging comments. And you know, Tyrone, to your point, Ryan, Caprina, I'm, I'm blessed to see Caprina in action every day, but Ryan, it's, it is clear from the way you talk about your yes, students yes. and balancing with your own children and your own life that you care. And, uh, you know, the yeah. unfortunate reality is that educators just may never receive their just due. Mm -hmm. And my mother told me a long time ago, if you're, if you're teaching, if you're doing anything and you expect people to praise you for that, you're in the wrong field. Wrong you're field. In the wrong field. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's wonderful what you are, are doing. You know, you did call your, I think you said first line, front line, uh, first responder, Ryan, when, when we open. You're absolutely right. It doesn't it doesn't become any more intimate than the learning environment or atmosphere when you're in when you're in proximity. And I would even, you know, I would I would venture to say, Miss um, Coleman, that even the virtual connection from from you know teacher to student is so crucial uh, in these particular times. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you to Caprina Coleman and Ryan thank Kaiser for joining us today. Thank you. For your insight and your expertise and your hearts. And uh, we're really happy that you're a part of the Baltimore City public school system and for the four, especially uh, <laughs> Caprina. Uh, Tyrone, any, any final thoughts for you, my friend, before we call it a day? Uh, no, again, just thank y'all. Tune in next Monday. You know, of course, yeah. we're here. We're at Tyrone's house on Thursdays. Uh, yes. Parents, if you all would like to come, uh, we talk to, you know, parents on Thursdays. Um, nice. We just have kind of, you know, it's, it's called Tyrone's house, and we just kind of digest and talk about issues that parents are facing and dealing with. So I think at some point to actually have a teacher like you all to come through and, nice. you know what I mean, just kind of like Linda... Mm -hmm you know, a note, a voice, it I would be freaking amazing. So if you all hear from me, you and then Ryan, I have a seventh grader here, so I'm going to be calling you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so just thank, thank oh, That's you. right. Thank y'all so much. It's, it's amazing. And thank you, Tyrone and, um, and William. Thank you so much for having this platform to speak. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we have to shout out... Uh, Rebecca, you know, when, uh, who is our producer and, you know, does all of the behind the scenes, you know, production and planning and organizing. And so shout outs to her. And, and um, But thank you all very much. We're going to let you go. Thursday, five o'clock, Tyrone's house. You all are invited, but family, you know, you should join us. You know, Tyrone, for all of the, you know, every Monday, I, I got a bone to pick with, our, with our, our family out there, Tyrone, because every Monday we say Tyrone's house, right? Five yeah. o'clock, join us on Thursday. And it's just not enough folks at the house, Tyrone. It's the regulars. And I love all regulars. I love all the people that come. <laughs> but we need more people. We need all the people that you named and listed today and every week that tune in. So yeah. come on to Tyrone's house on uh, Thursdays at five. It's a different okay. vibe. It's a different flow. Instead of me yapping so much, Tyrone will take over as uh, hosting the show because it's his show. Because it's his house. house. <laughs> <laughs> Our own house. Anyway, thank y'all, family. Love y'all. See y'all next you. Thank Monday. Thank you, nice meeting you, Ryan. Nice meeting you guys. Uh, nice and everybody. Bye. Awesome. Bye, Ron. Okay. Take care. Take care.